So, Tim, why do you think that uh, the study of language is important to philosophy or is fruitful way of approaching the subject? Although studying language doesn't necessarily tell you a, a huge amount about the underlying nature of the, the world, if, if you make mistakes about, about language, you are liable to be to be led into extremely bad metaphysics, uh, and um, even you know, as it were, even if a good philosophy of language can't give you a good metaphysics, bad philosophy of language can give you bad metaphysics. And and I think and I think people, um, be because of mistakes that they were making in the philosophy of language, which I, I still work corrected, um, were were arriving at all sorts of. Um, conclusions about how, how they thought that there was some kind of basic logical problem about the ideas that things could have their own essential nature which was just made them what the thing that they were and and they were ruling out a lot of metaphysical options on the basis of misunderstandings of language people talk a lot about the the linguistic turn in in philosophy and you know and it, for a long time i think People were uh, treating this as some kind of completely irreversible turn in philosophy, by which somehow uh, philosophy fundamentally had to do with with language and and words. It's quite understandable why people would think something like like that, because what, one of the sort of central methodological problems for philosophy uh, after the the scientific revolution was how much room that that the development of natural science left for philosophy to tell us anything about the uh, the world, and I think it w so. One a sort of kind of retreat that that pe attracted people uh, was the idea. Well, you know, in, when we're doing philosophy, we're not really studying how the the world is. We're just um, stud you know, thinking about either how we do talk about it or what might be a better way of talking about it and so on and just as it were clarifying language or something like like that and that I mean that was different versions of that idea were very influential but I, I think it's becoming clearer that um, that was really a 20th century idea which by the end of the 20th century was really on, actually on the way out and it, it doesn't mean yeah, that you can do philosophy without paying attention to language because that's where philosophy is done in language and you know we've got to understand how our instruments work in order to use them properly I mean if you're a, an astronomer you can't say look I'm in, I'm interested in the what's going on in um, in space I'm not I'm not interested in telescopes so you know don't, I'm not going to spend any time worrying about how my telescope works I mean that would be a very naive attitude for an astronomer and it's a, it's a naive attitude for a philosopher to take the same um, view of language that we don't need to bother about language we'll just use it to talk about the the world the role of language and philosophy is more like that than like the idea that somehow there's something very specially uh, linguistic about philosophical questions when philosophers are interested uh, in time um, you know people tried to interpret that as really that's just an interest in um, in the, the language that we use to talk about time or something like that. But I, I think it's become clear, actually, that a lot of the interesting philosophical questions are about time itself and not just about the language that we use about it. But if we, if we misunderstand the language that we use to talk about time, then we're probably going to reason very, very badly about, about time itself. So we do have to be kind of self-conscious about our uh, use of language, but without, as we're making that, anything like the, the subject matter of philosophy. Would you agree with that, Phil? I'm, I suppose I, yeah, I do agree with that, yeah. Um, of course, time, how we should think about it is a special problem since um, Einstein and all that has really changed our conception of which the natural conception is that just there is an objective, right, you know, flow of things are present, past, and so on. And then, of course, the picture has gotten very different. And this is some case where things outside philosophy have affected um, the philosophical problems. Yeah. I was going to ask yeah. you how important to you is that, you know, your views are grounded in common sense 
It's a very important. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I um, I always think the common sense view. Um, well, here I just meant something where maybe physics has undermined what might have been otherwise the natural common sense view. But other than things like that, I think one should preserve. G. Moore, who was famous in the 20th century for advocating that the common sense view of the thing should be preserved as much as possible, such common sense uh, knowledge or something like that is that there is a glass of water in front of me or whatever, or there are tables and chairs and people and so on. Uh, those are more certain than any philosophical theory. and. Uh, People who think that philosophical theory comes first are, are wrong, right? Maybe one thing that's worth saying about the, this example of, of time and special relativity, um, where you know, it seems that in some sense the what counts as present depends on uh, what frame of, of reference you have. I, mean, I think a lot of people you know, wonder whether there's any room left for philosophy to do anything about a subject like time because they think it could, shouldn't we just leave that to the the physicists you, you've got to take account of what the physicists have discovered and and you know it, it would not be sensible to try to to f talk about the nature of time without without t taking special relativity into account but the expertise of the physicists does not automatically extend to to working out what the the implications are for um, for for metaphysics for what this tells us in less formal terms about the about the nature of the the world and in particular as it were just how much of common sense is or isn't undermined by by the science I think it's I mean that's something that philosophers have their own distinctive skills in in thinking about not that it's at all uh, Easy. A good way of dramatizing a piece of science is by uh, presenting it as having refuted some piece of, of common sense. Uh, and I mean, that's maybe a good way of getting grant money. But um, it, um, it's often when you look at, at the science, you see it doesn't have a, as much of an, an effect in undermining common sense it may, may not leave common sense exactly where it was but but it may not be as di as disruptive of common sense as you know that scientists hyping their own discoveries like to pretend right I, I, I entirely agree yeah an important distinction that you stress in eminent necessities between the metaphysical and the epistemological and uh, you try to separate the notions and I mean, your analysis of names, your work on, on language led you to that, so. It's hard to say something without um, telling people to read the book, but a lot of, <laughs> a lot of and, and of course this is a general audience anyway, but um, look, I came to conclude that a lot of the confusions that, well, that were dominant, say, in the Quinean era that I was talking about came from confusing two different things. What is, what do we know um, a priori, that is in the absence of anyway, much experimental knowledge or anything, right? Or what, we, well, there's also what we know for certain, which is a different issue really, because um, a mathematical calculation may be a priori, but it isn't certain you may have made a mistake in the calculation. Anyway, those are epistemic notions, notions about knowledge. Okay, but then according to me anyway, what I concluded, and uh, Hillary Putnam had in some respects some similar views about this, some sorts of statements about uh, necessary properties of particular things like if this table was made of one substance, the very same table couldn't have been made of another one, right? But that it's made of this substance rather than of that one is not something you necessarily know, but you find out. So people thought that meant it wasn't necessary, but I think that that's confusing and epistemological with what I call a metaphysical notion or really a notion about 
what might have been, not what may or may not be, you know, for certain, right? And I wouldn't think any counterfactual situation that doesn't contain this very substance, which is H2O, would contain water, right? Um, though we don't know without scientific um, investigation what water consists in, right?